Chapter 2, Relaying in General. The purpose of protective relaying is that faulted power equipment must be removed from service quickly to minimize the equipment damage, limit the effect of the disturbance, and maintain the stability of the system. Protection schemes are required to recognize and isolate all faults rapidly and with a high degree of reliability. Protective relays should be dependable, that is, they should operate when required to, and they should provide security, that is, they should not operate when not required to. They've also often been nicknamed the silent sentinels of the system. In line with these objectives, duplicate protections are provided whenever the system stability studies show the requirement for high-speed clearance of faults. In addition to duplicate sets of relays, this entails the use of separate CT secondaries and two protections, separate VTs and separate CVT secondaries, separate batteries, separate trip, con trip coils, as much as possible, control wiring is also kept separate to ensure that a single contingency will not render both protections on an element inoperative. The following are the protection requirements for a system. Selectivity means that the protect protective scheme should accurately identify the problem, tripping only the minimum possible number of circuit breakers required to isolate the fault and interrupt the minimum number of customers and ensure that a minimum number of system elements are taken out of service. Unnecessary interruptions cut into revenue and reduce customer satisfaction. Unnecessary removal of system elements contributes to the overloading of equipment remaining in service and could contribute to the instability conditions. Speed is required to minimize the damage to the faulted equipment and also minimize the hazard to personnel who may be in the vicinity. Reliability. Relays remain inoperative for a long time before faults occur. But if a fault does occur, the relays must respond instantaneously and correctly. Traditionally, utilities, uh, utility facilities have favored dependability rather than security. That is, they, would, they prefer false trips to failure to trip. Sensitivity of reeling equipment must be sufficiently sensitive so that it can operate reliably when the level of the fault condition just crosses a predefined limit. Relay protective schemes are wide and varied depending on their need as well as the age of the system. Some of the newer IED relays, which are basically small little computers in themselves, will incorporate many complete schemes in one box and often call it protection management. But a great deal of the old school relays and systems are still in existence today. Regardless, if all in one box or installed separately on many panels, these are some of the main categories. Differential schemes are used as primary protections on buses, transformers, generators, and other rotating equipment. Some schemes employ primary and backup relays, usually on equipment in smaller and older stations. Newer and larger equipment is protected by duplicate protections. Trans transmission line protection schemes are also many and varied, depending on the requirement, but usually include both phase and ground fault protection. Some factors considered in the design of line protection are length of the circuit, importance of the circuit to the bulk electrical system, availability of communication and carrier equipment, and if there is any stations tapped off along the line. Bulk electrical system transmission lines, if they are short, five to three miles long, say, often employ 
pilot wire differential schemes. Other high tension lines are protected by distance or impedance relays almost exclusively. These transmission line protection schemes are further divided into two zone distance protections, phase comparison protection, directional comparison protection, direct underreaching protection, and permissive overreaching protection. And of course, there is the coordinated overcurrent protection used on feeders. Circuits used for supplying customer loads that are normally operated radially usually employ phase and ground overcurrent schemes like this. Other protection used on the bulk power system are breaker failure protection, CT and breaker flash protection, remote tripping. Remote tripping employs a, a carrier channel to send remote trip signals to a terminal to operate circuit breakers at another location. The remote trip is initiated by protective relays associated with the faulted equipment and the distance that they're uh, remotely tripping is usually not too far. Transfer tripping over longer distance. Transfer tripping accomplishes the same end results as remote tripping, but employs a guard signal on a carrier channel which serves as a channel monitoring signal. Fault detecting relays key the transfer trip transmitter and shift the guard signal to trip the frequency which is accepted by the receiver and initiates a tripping at the remote end terminal. More about these uh, transfer tripping and remote tripping schemes later. A complete protective relaying scheme consists of the following components or elements. Fault sensing or primary relays along with current and voltage transformers. These constitute the means by which the actual system condi conditions are monitored by sampling the system conditions uh, as they occur during fault conditions. Action selecting or auxiliary relays perform the logic path that the sequence for final tripping takes place. Fault isolating or trip output relays and DC control systems starting with the battery banks which are the source of tripping potential. The station batteries are unaffected by system disturbances and re remain a reliable source of energy for operating circuit breakers. Finally, circuit breakers are required to respond to the tripping signal, open their contacts, and extinguish the resulting current arc in a very short time, typically two cycles on a 60 hertz system. In keeping with the concept of duplicate protection schemes, the breaker Breakers can carry two trip coils and control wiring is kept separate to minimize the risk of failure to operate. Therefore, there is usually two separate battery banks used as well. When a system fault occurs, the older schemes, uh, or with the older schemes, the fault detecting relays in both primary and backup groups of the zone protection involved begin to operate simultaneously to initiate action to clear the fault. Ordinarily, the primary group will complete the operation and remove the faulted element from the service before the backup relays can operate uh, and complete their travel. The relays in the backup group will then reset as soon as the faulty condition has been removed. If the primary relays, for some reason, fail to clear the fault, the backup relays will continue to the travel and the trip and trip the appropriate breakers. If the backup relays on the zone concerned also fail to clear the fault, the backup relays on adjacent zones 
are relied on to isolate the defected component. To limit the extent of the power system that is disconnected when a fault occurs, protection is arranged in zones. Ideally, the zones of protection should overlap so that no part of the power system is left unprotected. A power system is divided into protective zones which can be conveniently protected by a group of relays and which can also be conveniently disconnected or separated from the rest of the system. The normal protective zones are demonstrated here. For example, the generators have this zone of protection and they will trip the A and the B breakers and isolate any faults uh, contained within that zone uh, in the dotted lines there. The transformer zones are demonstrated here. You can see that there's a, a breaker on each side of the transformer and the zone of protection is inside the area of the two breakers. Similarly, buses are protected in the same manner, this time with uh, more than two breakers. In one case it's four and the other is three, but in each of the cases all the breakers would operate to isolate that particular zone. And the trans transmission line circuits also have their zone of protection and would isolate by tripping the two associated breakers as indicated there. This slide illustrates the principle of zone protection. Note that the zones overlap the associated circuit breakers. For a fault in a circuit breaker, both adjacent zones are required to operate, as indicated here. Protection schemes, older ones, generally consist of at least two groups of relays designated primary and backup. The primary group operates instantaneously with no intentional time delay. The backup group operates with an intentional time delay designed uh, to back up the primary relays in the zone in which they themselves are connected, as well as completing uh, the complete relay in the adjacent zones if for some reason both the primary and the backup relays in those zones fail to function. This uh, slide uh, will further demonstrate what is meant by zones of protection and ideally the fact that the zones of protection have to overlap so that no part of the system is left unprotected and in fact, it's better to have two uh, protection schemes operating uh, rather than none. Protective relays may fail to operate or having operated may fail to clear a fault for one of the following reasons. Failure of a current or voltage intelligent supply due to faults in the CT or VTs or in the secondary circuits. Failure of the DC tripping supply. Mechanical or electrical failure of the protective relays. Failure of the appropriate circuit breakers to trip due to mechanical or electrical troubles in the breaker. And finally, failure of a carrier channel which provide in provides intelligence on remote tripping or transfer tripping schemes. For these reason, reasons, protection systems have backup and or redundancy built into them. Many factors may cause protection failure and there's always some possibility of a circuit breaker failure. For this reason, it is usual to supplement primary protection with other systems to back up the operation of the main system, ensure that nothing can prevent the clearance of the fault from the system. Backup protection may be obtained automatically as an inherent feature of the main protection scheme or separately by means of additional equipment. 
Time graded schemes such as overcurrent or distance protection schemes are examples of those providing in inherent backup protection. And you'll see this later as we look at those uh, systems more or those protection schemes more closely. The faulty section is normally isolated discriminatively by the time grading. But if the appropriate relay fails or the circuit breaker fails to trip, the next relay in the grading sequence, sequence will complete the operation and trip the associated breaker, thereby interrupting the fault circuit one section further back. In this way, complete backup coverage is obtained. One or more sections may be isolated and is desirable, desirable but this is inevitable in the event of a failure of a circuit breaker. Duplicate high-speed protective schemes or systems may be installed. These provide excellent mutual backup coverage against failures of protection equipment. Ideal backup protection would be completely independent of the main protection. Current transformers, voltage transformers, auxiliary tripping relays, trip coils, and DC supplies would be duplicated. This is known as duplicate protection and is becoming the norm in today's relaying systems. The two protections are both first line protections and with both protections in service, they will both operate instantaneous, instantaneously to clear an in-zone fault. Breaker failure protection is provided to cover the possibility that even though everything else works properly, a circuit breaker may fail to trip or having trip may fail to interrupt the fault. In older schemes and older station, the uh, backup scheme uh, operated like this. Sometimes the main protection scheme would have dedicated backup schemes attached to it. This dotted line shows the zone of protection for the main bus protection. As I said, the older backup uh, uh, systems uh, are usually were usually timed or are usually timed because some of them are still in, this, in existence today in order to give the primary relays a chance to clear the problem. And they were usually not, not necessarily had defined zones, they would reach into the next zone quite readily, but because of their uh, timed, definite time uh, characteristic, would not operate the, instantaneously, they would give the primary relays a chance to operate, but they would provide a backup protection even for other zones and other sources of protection. This uh, slide will demonstrate uh, how the older backup relaying systems would operate under certain conditions. Just as an example, if a fault occurs on G2 and the primary relaying fails to trip breaker B, the G2 backup relays will also attempt to trip breaker B, but after a, a slight time delay. If the breaker B still fails to open for, it, for any reason, the backup relaying associated with the transformer zone will attempt to trip breakers B and D even though D is not in G2 zone. Hence, the backup relaying would uh, act to clear the fault on G2. Similarly, if a fault occurred on the Z bus, the bus zone protection should operate to trip breakers G, H, and I. However, if breakers G and or H did not trip for any reason, then breakers E and F should be tripped from the transmission line backup protection, again, isolating the fault. Again, at the risk of repeating ourselves, protective relays 
are of two types, fault detecting relays and auxiliary relays. Fault detecting relays are those which monitor system conditions and by their design and settings determine whether these conditions are within permissible operating limits or whether they represent a danger or fault condition. Auxiliary relays operate only when initiated from fault detecting relays. In older schemes, both the primary and backup relay groups contain fault detecting and auxiliary relays. In some cases, some of the auxiliary relays may be common to both groups. In the newer standards, uh, protection schemes with duplicate protections, both fault detecting and auxiliary relays are found, but the policy is to keep each group independent of the other, even to the extent of having separate trip coils in the zone, uh, in the zone circuit breakers. There are a number of other factors which are not faults as such, but which may be indicative of faults and which are used to initiate automatic removal of equipment from service. Some of these are, for example, pressure, uh, the buckholds relay that is embedded in the tank of a, of a power transformer containing insulating oil uh, would react to uh, pressure inside the tank of the transformer and either uh, alarm or trip uh, the breaker uh, to isolate the the transformer. There is also temperature sensing devices including the temperature of transformers which will either uh, give a signal to the operator that uh, an unsafe condition is, is happening and he would then or she would then remove that piece of equipment from service or if the temperature was high enough it would automatically uh, initiate a trip to uh, isolate that particular piece of equipment. In the case of rotating equipment, you also have uh, speed protection, overspeed protection. Uh, for example, if a, if, a, if a generator starts to disconnect from the system and it still has the, uh, the water pressure, say, driving it, it could enter into an overspeed condition, which could be damaging to the equipment. So you'd want to make sure you isolate that piece of equipment, including the prime mover, which would be the water that's causing the the, the rotor to rotate too fast. You also, in the case of usually um, uh, diesel type uh, generators or reciprocating type uh, generators, the have, they have inherent vibration monitors and if the vibration exceeds a certain preset level then it would either uh, send out an alarm signal to the operator or it would automatically trip the unit itself. These are just a few uh, that would be, uh, you might find in a system. Actual electrical faults are characterized by one or a combination of the following. Ad abnormally high current in one or more of the phases. Unbalanced currents in what would normally be a balanced system. Uh, this would also tend to generate neutral current that normally is zero and abnormally abnormally low voltages in one or more of the phases these characteristics enable the protective relays to identify the location and locate the fault and initiate action to clear the faulted equipment the types of electrical faults usually fall into one of these uh, categories you can have a phase to ground uh, short circuit where one of the phases will actually touch the ground or it could touch the steel tower which is grounded. Uh, it is classified as a phase to ground short circuit. You can also have the, uh, the situation where two conductors would touch. Uh, in this case it's called a phase to phase short circuit. Uh, this hypothetically could happen in a long uh, tower span or between two towers or between two pole structures where wind gusts would cause the conductors to swing into each other uh, where two of the phases would touch and you would have a phase-to-phase -phase short circuit. 
You can also have a phase-to-phase -to, -phase to ground short circuit, and you could have a three-phase short circuit. Now, three-phase short circuits seldom occur naturally because usually a phase-to-phase -phase or phase-to-ground situation would trip uh, any of the protection ahead of the time of three conductors being simultaneously connected together. However, there is one case where three-phase short circuits occur, and that is during maintenance procedures, if ground clamps, which are placed in, in, in position during the maintenance, are forgotten and left on when the line is energized, then you would have a situation where the three phases would be shorted together and you would have a three-phase short circuit condition. These four uh, types of faults are all called short circuits. You can also have a chance where one of the phases would have a high resistance or phase to ground uh, connection, either by virtue of the fact that the resistance is high or the fact that you've got a return path with a, a high impedance uh, resistance in series with the conductor. Regardless, this is caught, it is classified as an open circuit. Very difficult to detect. And lastly, you could have just a straight open phase or open circuit where one of the conductors breaks without touching another conductor or ground. Uh, this just contributes to an unbalanced condition, but you don't have any large currents flowing that could be detected easily. So these, this type of a fault is very difficult to detect as well. Now, these types of faults that we just mentioned um, have been uh, categorized and, 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 and uh, logged and uh, statistics have been uh, checked out on these type of faults. And this is what we found was that single phase to ground faults are predominantly the most common type of faults in a power system. 70 to 80 percent of the faults are single phase to ground type faults. Phase to phase to ground faults uh, constitute a smaller percentage, 10 to 17 percent uh, of these type of faults occur naturally. Phase to phase faults are even uh, lower in ratio, there's 8 to 10 percent, and three phase faults are very, very low, again, because they don't occur naturally, and hopefully people remember to take the ground clamps off when they're finished doing the maintenance. So three phase faults are usually two to three percent. And as we said, open circuits are very rare. Uh, I don't have any statistical uh, values on that, but they're rarer than all the rest. In a large system with many scattered sources of generation, the transmission grid, which operates at the highest voltage level, is the central part of the system. Thus, as the voltage class of equipment increases towards the 230, 500, or 735 kV transmission level, the interdependence with the system as a whole becomes greater, and outage or malfunction of the equipment has a greater system impact. For this reason, protection schemes tend to be more complex for transmission systems with more safeguards for system security at a higher and higher voltage levels. The voltage class of equipment has a fairly direct relationship to its cost, other factors being constant. High voltage equipment is more valuable than low voltage counterparts of the same capacity. In addition, in a large system, short circuit values are usually greater at higher voltage levels. High voltage lines are longer and generally with greater exposure to the elements and other influences. This has a bearing on the type of relaying protection that is desirable. The various components of an electrical system may be grouped under the following main headings according to the function 
as shown in this table. However, generally speaking, we often classify the system components into either generation, transmission, or distribution. Just out of interest, uh, most faults in an electric utility system with a network of overhead lines are one phase to ground faults resulting primarily from lightning induced transient high voltage and from fallen trees or limbs and in overhead distribution systems momentary tree contact caused by wind or other other uh, major causes of faults. Also in northern uh, hemispheres uh, where there is winter, uh, such as in Canada, ice, freezing snow, and wind during severe storms can cause many faults and much damage. We're going to talk a little bit now about electrical devices in a power system and their representation uh, that you may find them on uh, electrical engineering drawings or designations or identifications. In the design of electrical power system, the ANSI or ANSI, American National Standards Institute, applies standard device numbers that identify the features of devices in a, in an electrical system such as a, pr a protection system. A relay or a circuit breaker will have a specific number attached to it and that is a standard number that you will come to recognize as a power system analyst. They are unique numbers and they are used worldwide uh, so this standard applies to just about everywhere. One physical device may correspond to one function number. For example, 29 is an isolating switch, or a single physical device may, be, may have several functional numbers associated with it. And I'll show you examples of that in a few minutes. They will add suffix, suffixes and prefixes to that number to further identify it and describe it and, and again you'll see that as we go along. The function descriptions are given by the IEEE standard C.37.2-1994 um, You can look that up and you would find these numbers as I've indicated them here. You can also go on the internet and find uh, a lot of uh, reference to these numbers if indeed you want to uh, build them and remember them yourself. And this is a continuation of that listing, uh, IEEE C.37.2-1991. And comprehensively, every one of these numbers would uniquely describe a function of a particular electric device on a drawing or uh, on type of a, any type of a schematic. For instance, this is a, a small little section of a drawing uh, where we have numbered some of the uh, functions that are attached to it. We have a, a bus with a, uh, a generator attached to it and a breaker and you can see that, for instance, the 21G uh, is uh, on the current and voltage transformers, uh, and it's indicating that there is a distance relay attached to uh, that particular part of the drawing. You can also see that there's over excitation protection on this generator, and it's designated by the number 24. And excitation uh, is associated with the number 40, so loss of excitation is uh, designated as 40, as seen here. You also have over voltage protection on uh, either this bus or, or this uh, generator, and it's designated by the over voltage number 59. And lastly, there is differential protection, and it's differential ground protection. In this case, it's 87G, 
and uh, it's designated by the number 87 in the letter G. As I stated earlier, suffix and prefix letters may be added to further specify the purpose and function of a device. Relay identification is usually designated in a fractional configuration, such as you see here. The number in the numerator, B94, capital R, capital T, little r, little t, in this case, the numbers are significant depending on the utility requirements. This is an old Ontario Hydro, now Hydro 1 standard, where the big B would indicate that they are using the B battery coil. Number four, 94, of course, is the ANSI designation for a, uh, a, an auxiliary relay uh, trip device function. The capital R, capital T, in the case of the, uh, the, the customer or the client that's using it, uh, that is to specify a remote trip. And the little r and the little, uh, sorry, the little r is a receive function. And the small t means that this relay is a time relay. And you can see that the numbers in the denominator, RRKN-307, are the manufacturer's relay designation, as in, it was at this time an ASEA or an ASEA type now ABB, ASEA brown uh type relay. And sometimes the relay parameters are listed. And in this case, the relay is rated for 110 to 125 volts uh, DC. It has a time delay range of 0.05 to 0.5 seconds on pickup. And the coils in this squiggly shape line are uh, the positive and negative signs are indicated as to where they're connected in the system. The uh, normally open and normally closed contacts are indicated as in this slide. There is also relaying terminology out there or jargon that is used and we should, uh, we kind of fall into the habit of using that once we get associated with it, but it's worth mentioning here so that uh, the newcomer or it's a good review for us uh, as we look at it in these slides. Relay operation. An electromechanical relay is said to have operated when sufficient current is passed through the operating coil to cause movement of the mechanical components and move the contacts to open or close depending on the design and the purpose of the relay. For solid state relays, the relay is said to have operated when the quantity to which it responds has reached a value where the logic circuit initiates action to cause a set of contacts to open or close depending on the purpose of the relay. Relay resetting. Most electromechanical relays operate against a restraint spring or gravity and with the result that when the actuating quantity disappears or is reduced below a preset pickup value, the relay will reset. These relays are called self-resetting. However, some relays, once they have operated, will not reset themselves. These are known as manually resetting or lockout relays. Solid state relays are similar in that once the actuating quantity disappears or drops below a pickup value, the logic circuit allows the resetting of the contacts of that relay. Relay pickup and relay dropout. If the actuating quantity applied to the relay is gradually increased, a point will be reached at which the relay will operate. 
This minimum operating value is called the relay pickup value. If the actuating quantity is then gradually decreased, a point will be reached where the relay contacts reopen. This value is called the relay dropout value. Pallet switches are auxiliary switches provided in a circuit breaker and sometimes a disconnect switch. Uh, and liked to the operating me mechanism in such a way that they are open or closed by the operation of the main device. Those switches which open when the device opens are called A pally switches. Those which open when the device closes are called B pally switches. And you can see in the diagram here I've got a, uh, a 52A and a 52B. The 52 being it's a breaker and the uh, A and B says whether it's an A or a B pally switch. If we open the breaker you can see that the A pally is open and the B pally is closed. If we close the breaker you can see that the A pally is closed and the B pally is open. Normally open and normally closed contacts. A contact which is open if the relay has not operated is called a normally open contact. If it is closed when the relay has not operated, it's called a normally closed contact. On electrical drawings, all contacts are shown open or closed as they are when the relay is not operated. Even though in normal operation, it may be that the relay is picked up, Symbols for normally open and normally closed contacts are shown here. Under certain circumstances, it may be desirable to ensure that once a relay has operated, it remains in the operated position or picked up for a definite period of time or until certain other events have occurred. In such cases, a relay CLIM is provided. A typical CLIM circuit is shown here and in the interest of simplicity, only the wiring associated with directly with invo directly involved with the ceiling is shown uh, in this diagram. Assume that contact X has closed. Contact Y is normally closed, and therefore the relay will be fed with positive uh, DC current and it will pick up. In doing so, it will cause contacts 1 and 2 to close and contacts 3 and 4 to open. In closing, contact 1 applies DC positive potential to the relay coil. Regardless of whether contact X is now open or closed, the relay will stay picked up until contact Y is open, thus de-energizing the relay coil and permitting the contacts to return to the normal position. In this case, the relay is said to have been sealed in during that period of time. Continuing on with uh, relay terminology, we're going to talk about uh, definite time relays and inverse time relays. A definite time relay is one in which the time delay induced remains constant over one operation to the next regardless of the severity of the fault condition. So diagrammatically you can see here that the uh, current is feeding the coils of this particular relay which will pick up a contact that a predetermined level and the timer is a basically a, a DC timer here will operate after a period of time regardless of the current that's flowing there will still be a time induced and that's called a definite time 
relay. An inverse time relay is one in which the rate of travel of the moving contact assembly increases with an increase in magnitude of the actuating quantity. The time required to close the contact de decreases as the fault current increases. This is used to be a very popular relay before the time of, of uh, electronic relays and there's still a lot of them in the system today and, and they work and function very well in that this more severe or the higher the fault current, the faster the relay will operate. And depending on how they're built, there's different characteristics as to, you know, how fast the, that disc will move. The uh, time current curve for both of these type of relays are demonstrated here. You can see that the definite time uh, curve is red. And as the uh, current uh, increases, it will trip the relay and it won't trip it any faster or any slower once an initial value is met. However, in the case of the uh, inverse uh, time relay, you can see that it's uh, dependent on a curve and the, uh, the higher the, uh, the amperage, the faster the relay contacts will close. This ends chapter two.